Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. Thank you so much for joining me last week to talk about Colin and Cuthbert. We have a new court catch up this week. I hope you have a good 4th of July week. That's when I'm recording it a little bit early than I normally would. And even as I was going through the news today to just take a look at the news cycle on this topic, there is tons in the news cycle, but not much about what's going on in court. So today we are catching up with what's going on with Britney Spears ahead of some trial setting dates. I've seen some confusion about whether there's a trial starting in July or what's happening with um, the 12th accounting and everything that's going on in court with the post-conservatorship litigation. And that's what we're talking about today because the media has been full of conversation about Britney Spears, but not much about what's going on in court anymore. And I got you with that. It's heavy. We're going to have to talk about the heaviness a little bit too. Um, and my voice is recovering from VidCon, but then I went to two Dave Matthews shows. So I've been doing my part at being completely irresponsible <laughs> for the summer and just, you know, YOLOing it through the last few weeks. It's like, well, it's going to all be fine. And hopefully it will be. So with all of that, we're going to get into today's episode. We have a number of documents from court we're going to cover. I have a lot of minute orders that I've gone through, and I'm gonna give you a summary of those to just update you as to where we are. So if you feel like you've been out of the loop, it's probably been six plus months since I've covered um, what's going on in court with Britney Spears, and I'm gonna tell you why after the intro. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. I know you can hear it in my voice that I have been traveling quite a lot, and the one beauty product I cannot travel without is my Thrive Cosmetics Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara. It has gotten me through summer concert season because my mascara does not end up all over my face. It does not flake. And at the end of a very long night, it washes off smoothly because it's got this incredible tubing technology that just like puts the mascara around your eyelashes to make them look naturally longer, but also come right off just with water. It really does mimic the look of lash extensions without the needed coordination or trip to the salon. It's no wonder it is one of Thrive's best selling products. Thrive Cosmetics also has the Bigger Than Beauty Promise where they make sure that every purchase supports local organizations that help communities thrive. You have to try Thrive Cosmetics to see for yourself. Right now, you can get an exclusive 20% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com slash lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash lawnard for 20% off your first order. All right, let's get back to today's episode. It has been, as I was looking back at my notes, about six months since I've covered what's going on in court with Britney Spears's post conservatorship litigation in any real substantive way. And as I was going back through, part of the reason why is because I am deeply frustrated by this case at this point, and it gets harder and harder to not just yell, which isn't really helpful legal commentary when the legal commentary is seriously, y'all, WTF is even happening. Why aren't we done yet? Why isn't there any resolution on the 12th accounting that was filed three years ago at this point? Why is there no 13th accounting? What is going on? So for those of you that have been way out of the loop, since the end of the conservatorship, there has still been a ton of litigation about Britney's money. You know my saying, and with everything, I'm going to tell you to follow the money. And that's what I'm doing in this case through court documents. I am watching what's going on in the media. And even today, there were a ton of headlines about whether or not Kevin Federline is moving to Hawaii. And Britney's attorney has said that she has no problem with the kids moving to Hawaii. Kevin Federline is apparently being sued for tuition to a private school for kids. It's There's a lot going on ancillary to what's going on in the post-conservatorship litigation that I'm not covering at this point. I'm just covering 
the post-conservatorship litigation and keeping an eye on what the media is covering and not covering and what's going on in court has not been covered really anywhere um, in any substantive way except for accounts on Twitter that that have kept a weathered eye on this case um, with absolute passion for it. The media has moved on to talking about Britney's Instagram, which I don't particularly find to be very helpful and not something that I'm going to be giving comment on. But what we've got since May of this year is a whole bunch of minute orders from hearings that go something like this. Case was called for hearing on May 10th. We had a whole bunch of hearings set for May 10th. May 10th, no lawyers appeared in court with the agreement of all the lawyers. Those were all continued to May 24th. And then what happens when you get back into court on May 24th? Things get continued again. And the minute orders don't come out until May 26th. And then everything gets continued to a trial setting conference for June 15th. And then everything from June 15th gets kicked over to July 24th. So every single hearing has been further iterations of kicking it down the road and not deciding anything. So where we're at right now is that there is trial set, which means a trial court judge is going to decide what's going on with the 12th accounting, the two petitions for James Spears' attorney's fees, and two orders to show cause. The orders to show cause are regarding why there's no 13th accounting for the shortened 13th year of the conservatorship and why there's no accounting from John Zabel. The Zabel accounting and Zabel, of course, came in after James Spears was yeeted. I don't know if Zabel has everything that was needed because there was so much back and forth about what documents have and have not been turned over to properly create that accounting. I'm not as worried about the accountings post James Spears as I am about why the fuck this 12th accounting has still been pending. Well, no, that's not true. I know why it's still pending. It's still pending because it's the first time Britney's legal team objected to anything because she got new legal representation. But trying to get to the point where this can go to trial has resulted in a ton of discovery battles over what documents get turned over and what don't, and a lot of mudslinging between James Spears and his attorney and Britney Spears' attorneys. Lots of back and forth in the legal documents, and we've seen some of the emails and lots of that too. But it's very frustrating to see every time it comes into court, it's truly just, we're setting it for another day, we're setting it for another day, we're setting it for another day. And the attorneys all seem to need more time, but this is all costing all sides a tremendous amount of legal fees. And that's wild to me, the amount of legal fees that are being spent as they are dealing with these discovery motions before this goes to trial. And you know what's gonna happen on June 24th? They're gonna set another court date. And then some of these got set out till September those the things that got set out to september are things the court needs to decide not things that are going to trial and then there are some september dates for the court to say hey what's happening in the trial court because now it's been sent to a trial court <sighs> that might answer some of your questions though as to who is going to take a look at what's going on with the 12th accounting it will be a different judge it will not be the judge who has heard everything leading up to this. So I am optimistic, maybe improperly so, but I am optimistic that putting this in front of a new judge is going to perhaps bring this to conclusion more swiftly. But fighting over this 12th accounting since it was filed in August of 2020 has gotten ridiculous for me. So today we're going to look at those two documents. I've just summarized like 15 minute orders for you, which are, um, we all picked a new day. Great. The lingering on this is tough. And the only thing Brittany's team is fighting other than discovery, which is the turnover of information. The thing that they are fighting in court is this 12th accounting, 
where did the money go? How was it spent? But it's only over that account, that last accounting for the 12th year of the conservatorship. The 12th accounting is also when Lou Taylor apparently just got a raise via email when Britney wasn't touring and James Spears was just like, we good, fine. And then it seems that Lou Taylor also had legal fees paid from the conservatorship for personal matters. Personal matters like trying to shut down websites that were hurting her feelings. So why is Brittany, through her estate, paying for legal fees for Lou Taylor to take down a fan website questioning Lou Taylor and her role in all of this? Why is that happening? These are questions that need to be asked, but I just wonder how many questions needed to be asked for years back and how much of that is never going to be answered at this point because I don't think we're going to get all the way back into the accounting years past. We're only getting in to that 12th accounting that is still pending. So what we're going to go look at now are two different briefs, a briefing from Brittany's legal team and a briefing from James Spears's legal team regarding the discovery status. This is all now before a discovery referee. A discovery referee is not this judge. It is a neutral third party who is helping deal with the discovery, answer questions of whether things are privileged or protected and can't be turned over. So they now, they, they basically have a discovery mommy who's going, it's like, mom, he won't give me the documents. And it's like, well, mom, they're supposed to be redacted. They have a neutral third party to mitigate the fight. It's like when you have to go to the teacher. The teacher, they're doing this to me. So we are still stuck in them battling, but I wonder still how much money Brittany is spending post-conservatorship in this litigation. It's got to be substantial. And it's concerning for me um, personally, as I look through all of this and I'm exhausted with it, I can only imagine how the litigants feel um, and how Brittany feels that this is still not done yet. It seems from social media, she's been able to vacation a bit more, but she's still not done. Like this litigation is still not done. Even though the conservatorship is not dictating her life, she still is under the weight of all of this litigation and mounting attorney's fees. And that can't feel free all the way yet. And again, if we're exhausted with it, I can only imagine how those involved feel. And then the continued negative media attention baffles my mind at this point. And I'm just, I'm not even going to highlight the types of headlines that I have seen um, because I don't want to see the negative headlines continuing to bring clicks and views. A year ago, everybody was like, have we learned nothing about the way we discuss people in the public eye? And it feels like we've gotten right back to, you know, before 2021, when Brittany talked about how abused and exploited she felt in court. And everybody was like, looking back at old um, headlines, looking back at the way that Britney Spears was treated. And it feels like, a slip back there, not valid questioning, just negative headlines, if that makes sense. And I think there is a difference between a, you know, is Brittany truly free from this conservatorship when the weight of this litigation still hangs over her? Why is this all taking so long? Where is the money? Um, why are her attorneys not choosing to pursue or seemingly not choosing to pursue other avenues of remedy? At this point, they haven't sued James Spears. There aren't any criminal um, any criminal charges pending. There may be investigations. We don't know. We haven't heard any of that. I think those are all valid questions. But I think the the straight up negative headlines that are meant to just grab clicks of you know Brittany not being allowed to see her kids before they move to Hawaii or whatever just isn't helpful at this point. But that's just my opinion. So we're going to look at the court documents and see what they say. If you have been waiting to try our sponsor, Green Chef, now is the time. 
make your summer nights a little easier by having delicious meals delivered right to your door that you can put together in just about 30 minutes. And now Green Chef has over 50 weekly menu items to pick from, and you can find something that's easy for you. Our family has been loving some of the salad bowls and paninis, just some other options if you're looking to change it up. And of course, they will meet you where you're at paleo, keto, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or if you're just looking for more balanced meals. You know that Green Chef is basically the only way we eat dinner at my house, and I hope that it will make your dinner time a little easier and more enjoyable. Go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 and use code emilybaker50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 to get 50% off plus free free shipping. Find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Let's get back to today's episode. This is filed by Brittany's team, by her attorneys, Matt Rosengart at all on June 20th, 2023. This is the requested status report on pending discovery motions before the discovery referee, who is a retired judge. I mean, I might not have made that clear when I said it's basically a discovery mommy, but it, <laughs> it is a retired judge deciding these things. But instead of going to the court where these matters are pending, they have a dedicated discovery referee who's handling these things. And that is retired judge Roy Paul. So let's get through a little bit about what's going on from the perspective of Britney Spears's team. On September 9th, 2021, after extensive briefing and a contentious and lengthy hearing, it sure was, the court suspended James P. Spears over his counsel's objection for running a quote-unquote toxic conservatorship of Britney Spears. On November 21st, 2021, the 13-year conservatorship, which among other things, was born in violation of conflict of interest rules, I don't disagree, and California's standards of conduct, was terminated. Rosengart always has a way of being snappy with their writing while being very direct. I appreciate their style of argument. Um, they definitely put it all out there in their motions, which I always appreciate because it's really the most information we get about this case at this point is buried in these filings. Yeeted Spears as counsel, and no, in the motion, they don't call him yeeted, but I do because between Mr. and Mrs. Spears, my brain will conflate the two. So if I don't separate them into yeeted and Brittany, I am going to get the Spears is wrong. So that is why I do that. But it, the motions have not gotten so informal as to start calling James Spears yeeted. <laughs> Sometimes they do call him the uh, terminated conservator, though. Yeeted Spears' counsel acknowledged in November 2021 that Yeeted's continuing fiduciary obligations under applicable case law required him to serve the interests of his daughter and her estate by expeditiously finalizing the pending 12th accounting. Remember... The 12th accounting was filed in 2020. This is conversation around it in November 2021. As I said here today, it is July 2023. It goes on to say, and finalizing the ultimate accounting of the conservatorship. Instead, shortly after filing a December 15th, 2021 petition against his daughter for payment of his new lawyer fees, despite being paid more than $6 million in fees and commissions as conservators, he proceeded to file nine motions against his daughter, including a failed motion to depose her, which the court denied last year. They've done a very good job of summarizing the road so far here. Yeeted's fee petition remains pending. There's actually two fee petitions that remain pending. The same for the same attorneys, but two different petitions for fees. This is fees that James Spears is asking to pay his new lawyers post conservatorship. Mm hmm. Lynn Spears also filed to have her attorney's fees paid and withdrew that motion. If you haven't seen me lose my mind over that motion, it was a number of months back. I will link it. It's on my Britney Spears, like all of the content on um, my YouTube channel. I have not summarized it as much on the podcast. We've done a lot of it live, but I will link that all below. Indeed, the court's probate notes have always recommended its denial for numerous reasons. And this is citing the probate notes recommended dwop and then it cites the probate code says specifically who is entitled to receive fees on account former conservators and their attorneys 
are not included in those sections. Those are the notes. Here's the thing for me. This is not in the motion. Here's the thing for me. Former conservators and their attorneys are not included in the sections of people who are entitled to have their legal fees paid by the conservatorship estate, i.e. Britney's money. Every time I say conservatorship estate, that just means Britney's money. So the day he was terminated as conservator, he has to pay his own legal fees. Why has it been pending since 2021 without the court denying it? Like, why keep dicking around with this motion, with the two motions? Why not just rule on them? Why are those motions still pending? Why is nothing getting resolved in court? It all gets kicked to new dates over and over and over again. But every time it gets kicked to a new date, Brittany still has to pay for her attorneys to, to prepare for court and for these hearings. If it is that clear in two different penal codes that former conservators are not included, deny the motions. What is the reasoning behind this? Because even if you deny the motions and Yeeted Spears appeals it, which he's done on other rulings in the past, it still doesn't slow down these proceedings on the 12th accounting. So why? Why are we not why are we not ruling on anything at this point? Back to the motion. It says the 12th accounting and fee petition have been a focus of this matter since late 2021. It's July 2023. As explained in the pending objections to the 12th accounting and is further summarized in the January 14th, 2022 declaration of former FBI special agent Sharina Body submitted in opposition to the fee petition, which I covered on YouTube. The 12th accounting includes numerous improper excessive charges resulting from Yeeted's breaches of fiduciary duty, self-dealing, conflicts of interest, and other misconduct. By way of brief illustration only, Mr. Spears's breaches during the 12th accounting period concern, and then they list out the issues that are coming up on the 12th accounting that still hasn't been resolved. Charging the estate for his illicit surveillance operation, which operation included A, monitoring Britney Spears' phones contemporaneously in real time, including confidential private and attorney-client privilege communications, and mirroring them to a device effectively controlled by Heated Spears and his security company, and two, placing a secret listening device in the home of his daughter. Britney was paying for black box security through the estate. Approving hundreds of thousands of dollars in payments with no supporting contractual obligation to TriStar Sports and Entertainment Group, resulting from TriStar's request for a retroactive raise. Go to work, ask for a retroactive raise, see how that goes. Let me know. Let me know how it goes. If you sent an email to work and we're like, hey, so could you retroactively give me a raise? And then they send you back an email being like, bet. Let me know if that happens. I'm super curious. I'm being sarcastic, I know what happens. TriStar's request for a retroactive raise and new fee agreement in the form of a minimum guarantee after Spears, Brittany, announced a work hiatus in 2019, which constituted a 260% increase from the amount it would have otherwise been entitled to receive for the year, as well as a special accounting fee, footnote one. 260% increase. Excuse me, YouTube? I would like a 260% increase. Thank you. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine just being like, hey, so I'm doing less work because a lot of what TriStar was managing was tours. Can you imagine? I'm going to be doing less work because no tours. And this is right pre-pandemic. So they didn't know about that yet. I'm going to be doing less work because no tours. Can I just get a... 260% increase in my fees. Let's look at footnote one. 
At the time, Yee did installed TriStar as Britney's business manager at the outset of the conservatorship. It was a fledgling company with no track record, and Yee did was heavily indebted to TriStar and its head, Lou Taylor, financially, creating a conflict of interest under California rule of court 7.1059 at SEC. And then they link a New York Times article about that. When that came out over a year ago, that somehow James Spears was in debt to TriStar and then they started the conservatorship and then put TriStar in as Britney's management. And then it seems there is no contract anywhere between Britney Spears and TriStar. The attorneys have been fighting over this for two years now. Where is the contract between Britney and TriStar? It seems that there is none. And then to allow James Spears to get paid as the conservator and then have other benefits paid for him and then take a percentage of the tours. The only reason the management group allowed a percentage of the tours, it seems, is because they were all scratching each other's backs, right? I have a, a way crasser analogy for that that I'm going to reserve till later and see how mad I get. But he installed TriStar, so TriStar had some indebtedness to him and allowed him to take a 1% cut of tours as well. <sighs> Point three, using estate funds to pay personal legal fees for TriStar's Lou Taylor as well as himself. Mm. These matters, the pending 12th account and the pending fee petition were purportedly the basis for Mr. Spears' nine discovery motions since December 2021, including the three motions now before the referee footnote two. Virtually all of Mr. Spears' discovery motions have been denied appropriately. For example, in June 2022, Mr. Spears moved to compel a deposition of his daughter, which the court, Judge Penny, denied, and which the Second District Court of Appeal also denied in full after Mr. Spears sought writ relief. I told you he appealed. He told us he was going to appeal. I was at that hearing, and I asked Weingarten afterwards, are you going to appeal? And he said, well, we're going to take a writ. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. You're going to take a writ. And they did. It was denied as to getting the deposition of Britney Spears taken. But they still tried again to take Britney Spears' deposition. Notably, under the recent Court of Appeal decision in Hudson versus Foster, these matters, particularly the illicit surveillance of Britney Spears that spanned about a decade, also warrant the setting aside of Mr. Spears' prior accounts, whether or not they were previously approved. I haven't seen a motion to do that. It would be very interesting if they retroactively try to clear all the accounts because of new law. I'm here for it. I would love to see it. It'd be very interesting to see. I worry that the impact of that would be, though, that Brittany would still continue to pay for all this legal fighting to try to get blood from a stone because even if all of the prior accounts are set aside, I don't know how much money there is to claw back from James Spears. So at some point, the analysis has to be done of what is the cost of legal fees to do that? And what are you going to get at the end of the day with the legal fees? Don't know. As Hudson, this is the case all they are quoting, as Hudson instructs, a conservatee has no general duty to investigate the accuracy or propriety of accountings. And the case is a 2000 or a 2021 case saying, quote, allowing for reopening of prior court approved accountings. Okay, strike everything I said earlier about whether they can go back into the old accountings. This is why you hire lawyers, right? Because they are saying, look, we've got a new 2021 case directly on point saying that we can reopen the prior court approved accountings. I wanna see the motion to do it. Thus, quote, the conservatee does not need to show that a misrepresentation could not have been discovered prior to the entry of the order approving the accounting. This is lowering the standard to allow a conservatee to go back into past accounting years. It goes on to say, indeed, where there exists a relationship of trust and confidence, it is the duty of one in whom the confidence is reposed, the conservator, to make full disclosure of all material facts within his knowledge relating to the transaction in question and any concealment of material facts is a fraud. It goes on to say a conservator has a fiduciary duty 
to provide a full disclosure of all material facts that affect the beneficiary's interest and an incomplete disclosure would amount to fraud because the fiduciary's obligation is affirmative. What that means is that you, the conservatee or the conservatee's attorneys don't have to question it. The fiduciary obligation is to come out with it all. And at the beginning of this, that would be disclosing the relationship between Yedid Spears and TriStar to start with. It goes on to say, a person acting in conscious disregard of the rights of another should be required to disgorge all profits because disgorgement both benefits the injured parties and deters the perpetrator from committing the same unlawful actions again. I don't know what there's left to disgorge from James Spears, though. In fact, the courts are particularly likely to grant relief from a judgment where there has been a violation of a special fiduciary relationship. The motion goes on to say this report to referee, however, focuses narrowly on the three discovery motions at issues. When are you bringing the other motion? Bring the other motion. I worry. Like, I'm of two minds on all of this, and I'm going to keep repeating myself that I'm of two minds on all of this, because again, dig, mention it all, dig into it all, set them aside, get the ruling to disengorge the profits. I just don't know how much Britney will spend in legal fees versus how much Britney would get at the end of the day to disgorge from James Spears. And I worry that financially it might be null and void. But emotionally, like emotional Emily is like, dig into all of it. But it's not my money that I'm spending, right? So that's a decision that Britney's gonna have to make with her lawyers. But they're hinting at it in this motion that they can. And I'm interested to see if they do. So there are three discovery motions at issue. Yedid's attempts to compel discovery from non-parties, the suggestive Paloma notice issued by the Second District Court of Appeal in December 2021, specifically two of three pending motions concerning Yedid's failure, uh, particularly two of the three pending motions concern Yedid's failed attempts to compel production of records from non-party Kroll Associates. That's the investigative report which employs the former FBI special agent, um, a body. The footnote three, we'll get there in a second. The motions involving non-party Kroll are Britney Spears and Kroll's motion to quash deposition subpoena for business records issued to a non-party or alternatively for a protective order and Yeeted's motion to compel compliance with deposition subpoena for production of business records, footnote four. So the two footnotes there are Miss um, Abadi's above reference declaration, which we covered was filed in response to the fee petition. It summarized Yedid's violations, underscoring why it would be so highly inappropriate to saddle Britney Spears with her father's newest attorney's fees on top of the more than six million in fees and commissions he paid himself while acting as conservator and the tens of millions he paid lawyers and others in the range of 10 figures. Concerning his own misconduct, as the probate notes preview. So in this footnote, we are told again that Yedid Spears has paid himself more than $6 million that they can account for, but has paid lawyers and others tens of millions into the range of 10 figures. 10 figures, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine. Bill, where, where, what? 10 figures. So how are we at the spending of 10 figures? How are we at like, what? A hundred million dollars? A thousand million dollars? Like a billion dollars? How are we at 10 figures? Because it says we're not at hundreds of millions. They go from tens of millions to the range of 10 figures. So I am confused if they mean hundreds of millions or if we're in like the billion dollar range. Because it's a big jump to go from tens of millions to 10 figures. I have questions. But where is the money? 
and trying to figure out how much was bled out of Britney Spears' estate seems to be one of the main goals of this discovery for Britney's team. I don't know how we get to 10 figures. I really want to know. I don't know, again, if they mean a billion, that's what they said in this legal filing, or if they mean nine figures, hundreds of millions. Either way, James Spears benefiting himself over six million is bananas. I'm not surprised if the legal fees and the fees that James Spears paid out and the fees with TriStar, I would not be surprised if that was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I wouldn't at all be surprised. Are we getting to a billion? I don't know. That gets into numbers that like my brain short circuits at. Is it possible? I don't know. They're saying that Britney Spears' estate now is only worth about $60 million. Where did it all go? Tours and perfumes and TV shows and music. And where is all the money? Because 60 million, I realize it's a lot of money, like in 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 non-pop star terms. But where did it all go? And we know that Britney wasn't lavishly spending for the 13 years of the conservatorship. She was um, very, very limited in what she could spend. And I have said this, since that 60 million figure came out, it seems compared to other celebrities and pop stars of her worldwide top of her game celebrity status, that seems to not be enough. 60 million seems low. And yes, we've got to account for tens of millions to lawyers, but where is the rest of it? And I hope that where the money went gets answered at some point. The motion goes on to talk about the motions involving non-party Kroll, which is the investigative agency that started to dig into all of this, and the fact that James Spears is trying to compel discovery from Kroll. Footnote 4 says James Spears also filed a second motion to compel compliance with deposition subpoena for production of business records to third-party Kroll, which is duplicative and now moot as discussed below. So this discovery is all, the bulk of this discovery fight is over what the investigation, the investigative agency has to turn over to James Spears. And here's the problem. There is going to be a push-pull on this if what Kroll has uncovered will be used at trial with regard to the 12th accounting. Normally, this would not be discovery. However, if they're going to use it at trial, some might be discoverable. So that's where we're going to have to push pull on this. The third pending discovery motion concerns Yedid's attempt to compel the production of records from whistleblower Alex Vaslov, also a non-party, but again, might be a witness at trial. Vaslov is a whistleblower formerly employed by Black Box Security, the security company Yedid hired, which carried out the above referenced illicit surveillance operation. And then they cite to the New York Times article about that, which is attached to this motion. They talk about Kroll being engaged as a consulting expert. We've already covered that in those Kroll motions and the subpoenas and the motion to quash, which again, we've covered um, in 2021 when they were all filed. So some of this is things that we have already covered. So we're not going to retread that ground, but they're going to summarize their arguments. So we're going to summarize it and then continue on. As summarized above, if Mr. Spears is entitled to anything further, and he should not be, it would be exemplars only to show that contrary to his counsel's January 19th, 2020, unequivocal representation to the court that the illicit surveillance didn't happen, Your Honor, as the facts even then showed it did in fact happen, and yeeted Spears well knows. See the transcript. We further submit that a controlled methodology is particularly important and necessary to protect Ms. Spears' privacy given the uniqueness and complexity of issues and previous efforts by Yeeted to disclose his daughter's private, sealed medical records and other confidential information in violation of her privacy rights and court orders, which also implicate uh, HIPAA and CMIA, for which he previously was rebuked by the court footnote 5. I really did enjoy this. 
So we're just going to go through it again. Footnote five. As part of his failed effort to depose his daughter, Yeeted Spears submitted her private medical records that were sealed by the court. To protect her privacy, we were forced to move on August 1st, 2022 to reseal her records, records that the court had already ordered sealed at the request of Yeeted Spears' former counsel before his new counsel reversed course and sought to publicize them. Even then, months after the underlying discovery motion had been moot on July 27th, 2022, when the court denied Yeeted's motion to compel, Spears and his counsel still opposed Britney's motion to seal on baseless grounds. In doing so, just we're still mid footnote, but they were arguing against the motion to seal records that were already sealed. In doing so, they proffered authorities that on their face did not apply and contrived a stipulated protective order. The court recognized Mr. Spears' misconduct at the October 26, 2022 hearing on the motion to seal, granting the motion, sealing the records again, and rebuking Mr. Spears and his counsel because, as the court aptly stated, quote, it was highly inappropriate and contrary to court orders for them to have offered these and other documents in their failed motion. And then it cites the transcript. So when I say that the motions have not moved anywhere forward in the last few years. It's because they continue fighting over the same ground over and over and over again, which is why Rosengard is pointing out that there have been nine discovery motions from James Spears since the end of the conservatorship. They next are arguing that in fact, Kroll has produced quite a bit of documentation already. On October 7th, 2022, the law firm's attorney, Freeney, sent a letter to Yeeted's counsel confirming the following points regarding Kroll's production. Point one, despite the fact that the Kroll subpoena was null and void as of July 27th because the subpoena had been quashed, Kroll made a meaningful and significant production of records in good faith on August 12th, 2022. Point two, that Mr. Spears had previously failed to sign a standard court-ordered protective order allowing the exchange of confidential information. Point three, Yeeted continued efforts to obtain the fruits of his illicit surveillance operation against his daughter, see subpoena request numbers 11 and 20, an operation that implicates federal criminal statutes were and remain highly inappropriate, to say the least, and would repeat the gross injustices and privacy injuries that were done to Ms. Spears. Thus, Mr. Freeney, the lawyer's letter proposed enhanced and necessary privacy protocols for controlled inspection of exemplars and materials. So again, this needs to be highly contained in the way that it is turned over. Their next point is that despite the above, an additional production of documents would be made by Kroll on October 7th, 2022. And their final point is that as to any claimed deficiencies with Kroll's voluntary productions, Attorney Freedy made clear that she was available to confer on all items on October 14th, 2022. Then they are getting into the alternative writ of mandate and we are going to cover that just a little bit, and then the whistleblower, and then we will move on to the next documents. Yeeted Spears filed his petition for writ of mandate on September 9th, 2022. The writ petition sought to overturn three discovery rulings of the court, the July 27th, 2022 ruling denying a deposition of Ms. Spears, the July 13th ruling denying Yeeted Spears' motion to compel production of documents from Brittany, and the July 27th, 2022 ruling quashing the subpoena for Kroll in its entirety. On December 16th, 2022, the Court of Appeal denied the writ petition in full as it concerned the first two discovery rulings. As to the Kroll subpoena, the appellate court issued an alternative writ of mandate, suggested Paloma notice, with an option to conduct further proceedings to determine whether or not the motion to quash the Kroll subpoena would be granted in part as opposed to in whole as to address the scope of privilege concerning the declaration. So they're asking the court to look at if everything needs to be quashed or if it needs to be a more narrowly tailored order. Notably, the other basis is for protection from an objection to the subpoena, such as harassment, undue burden, overbreath, abuse of process, privacy, lack of relevancy, all remain at issue. Footnote six, further as a practical matter, Yeeted Spears' October 11th, 2022 second, quote, 
motion to compel, filed more than two months after the Kroll subpoena was quashed by the court and more than two months before the alternative writ of mandate was issued by the Court of Appeals is superseded and moot. We're done with this, Your Honor. Move on. Yeeted's motion to compel against the whistleblower. On October 12th, 2022, Yeeted filed a motion to compel concerning a subpoena issued for whistleblower Mr. Vaslov. As set forth in his opposition, Vaslov's counsel objected to Spears' subpoena and sought sanctions against Spears and his counsel for numerous reasons. Initially, he observed that the subpoena had been issued, quote, in bad faith to harass and punish Vaslov for blowing the whistle on Jamie's wrongdoings, noting Yeeted Spears' probable crimes and other misconduct while serving as conservator, and further stating that Vaslov possesses no documents nor information relevant to the issues remaining in the case, i.e. financial resolution of claims between Spears and Spears. And his security firm, Black Box, that was hired to spy on, control, and commit crimes against Brittany by conducting a massive and blatantly illegal surveillance and spying operation of virtually every aspect of her life, Mr. Vaslov's opposition explained that, and here are the points. The documents that Yeeted seeks are held by Black Box, right? The company, not the person. Vaslov's former employer, with whom he stated Mr. Spears conspired to conduct the illicit, clearly illegal surveillance operation. As Vaslov's counsel's brief explained, quote, why not obtain the documents from Black Box with whom they share a joint defense agreement? A joint defense agreement means that Yeeted Spears and Black Box have agreed that if they have to defend things, they are going to work together instead of pointing the, fixture, the fingers and blaming each other, that they will work together. Just let that sink in. They have a joint defense agreement. Hey, whatever you did wrong, I did wrong. We all did wrong. Let's, uh, let's defend it together. Point two is that the subpoena attempts to compound the egregious gross privacy violations committed against Britney Spears. Point three says that Vaslov, a non-party, has asserted his Fifth Amendment rights concerning his own involvement in the clearly illegal surveillance operation which he exposed. Mr. Vaslov's brief rightly observes, even based solely on public information alone, there can be no serious dispute that the illicit surveillance occurred, as Mr. Spears himself obviously knows, and the subpoena to Vaslov, who, quote, heroically exposed it, should be quashed. So Vaslov is fighting to quash the subpoena against him, saying, go get the documents from Black Box. What I think Yeeted is going to argue is, yeah, but Black Box isn't going to be the one testifying if this comes up at trial, but the issues outstanding on the 12th accounting don't necessarily involve black box other than should black box have been paid. So it might come up, but it might not. They then go on to argue that Spears' motions should be denied and they request a discovery conference with the referee prior to any hearing. And then they attached all of the articles that they referenced from the New York Times, which is why this ends up being like a 36 page motion because a lot of it is exhibits. So that is the argument now, again, still before the court. There is limited new information in this. We got more information about the argument going on with why Vaslov wants his subpoena quashed, because I have not covered that yet. But we also are learning in a footnote for the first time exactly how many millions have been spent on lawyers. That is kind of just dropped into this motion. I imagine that Yeeted Spears' attorneys are going to have a thing or two to say when we take a look at their response to the discovery view disputes, which they filed seven days later. And we're going to take a look at that right now after a word from our final podcast sponsor for the day. It's that time of the year where the weather is getting warmer and weddings and family gatherings are in full swing. And if you want to look and feel your best, today's sponsor, Honey Love, has you covered. I have absolutely loved working with them because I use and love their products. From bras to their number one selling superpower short, I have tried it all and enjoy it because most of the time when you find shapewear or sculptwear, it can feel a little too tight. And that is not something I have experienced with Honey Love. The Superpower Short is an absolute go-to. It's targeted compression technology, distinguishes between areas where you want more support and areas where you need less compression. So you can do things like breathe, 
The Signature X targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing your natural curves, and it works with your body, not against it. And what you will love about the Power Short is it doesn't roll down. I know, it's so nice. Treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% at honeylove.com slash lawnard. Use our exclusive link down below to get 20% off at honeylove.com slash lawnard. Let's get back into today's episode. We are going to hit the main points of Yeeted Spears' motion before the discovery referee. This was filed on June 27th. This is Spears' brief regarding discovery disputes presently before the discovery referee. And this was filed again with the court, um, letting the court know the status of what's going on before the discovery referee. The preliminary statement, Britney Spears repeatedly accuses James Spears, who they in this motion call Jamie, who I will call yeeted, of wrongdoing in public court filings and on social media with her counsel claiming the accusations will be supported at trial by the publicly filed declaration of Sharina Body, a purported expert, and documents from Alex Valsov, a purported whistleblower. However, neither Brittany Abadi, Abadi's employer Kroll, or Vaslov produced documents supporting the allegations, a particularly egregious course of conduct with respect to the Abadi materials, given that the Court of Appeal found a privilege waiver in December 2022, over six months ago. Yeeted is entitled to discovery regarding Brittany's allegations, the documents Brittany claims to support those allegations, and the documents Brittany represents will be relied on at trial. I agree as to the relied on at trial. If things are going to be relied on at trial, they need to be parsed through for what's discoverable. But again, Yeeted's attorneys always come out swinging. They go on to say that Jamie exhaustively attempted to obtain discovery regarding the Abadi Declaration and Valsolf statements. First, Jamie attempted, we, well, we know that there were nine motions filed. At least everyone agrees that this is an exhaustive attempt. I'm exhausted. Are you exhausted at this point? Who else is exhausted? First, Jamie attempted to obtain the documents from Brittany, but Brittany refused and told Jamie to obtain the documents from Abadi and Vaslov. Second, Jamie attempted to obtain the documents from Kroll, Abadi's employer, but Kroll moved to quash the subpoena and forced Jamie to take the dispute to the Court of Appeals which found that any privilege that could apply to a body's documents had been waived. I don't think that's exactly it. Third, Kroll represented it was it would produce documents in response to certain requests, notwithstanding the motion to quash, but later backtracked and refused to produce documents even after Jamie moved to compel and for sanctions. Fourth, Jamie attempted to obtain documents from Vaslov, but Vaslov refused to produce a single document without justification, Last, Jamie attempted to obtain documents from a body personally, but she refused and told Jamie to obtain documents from Kroll, her employer. It's clear that there are either no documents to support the salacious allegations against Jamie or whatever documents exist are being wrongfully withheld. Kroll now attempts to avoid the orders of the Court of Appeal and probate court finding privilege was waived as to the body documents. Kroll counsel claimed at the June 1st, 2023 Conference of Counsel, which is not a public court hearing, that the Court of Appeal issued a Paloma notice, not so. Jamie filed a petition for writ of mandate. Brittany filed an opposition to Jamie's writ petition. Jamie filed a reply in support of the writ petition. The court issued an alternative writ of mandate that ordered the probate court to change its ruling or appear at a hearing to defend its order. In response, the probate court reversed its prior ruling. The court orders were not mere suggestions, but rather made clear that the documents relating to the Abadi Declaration must be produced. So this is the fight over discovery from Yedid's perspective. Meanwhile, it says Vaslov has made no effort to comply with Jamie's subpoena. Well, they filed a motion to quash, so they're disputing whether they have to comply. The orders of the Court of Appeal and Probate Court relating to the Abadi Declaration make it clear that there's no legitimate basis for Vaslov to refuse to produce even a single document. I don't think those two things are connected. Those are separate companies, separate situations, and separate witnesses. And of course, Jamie must be given the documents Valsov voluntarily provided to a body and the New York Times and that Brittany intends to rely on at trial. Three pending discovery issues arose from withholding the Abadi and Valsov documents. And these are the ones that were, that were discussed in the motion from Brittany's side as well, that there are these, these central issues that the discovery referee is going to have to 
sort out. Statement of facts. They say that narrow issues remain after the court terminated the conservatorship on November 12th, 2021. The issues remaining for trial fall into two groups, the 12th accounting and the objections to it and the pending contested petitions to approve payment of attorney's fees. I think that really accurately and concisely states what we're all here for. Money. The 12th accounting money and money to the attorney's money. It says Brittany has not brought any affirmative claims against Jamie or any other party in connection with the conservatorship. That's true, and we all have questions. Instead, Brittany allowed statutes of limitations to run on certain potential claims, including any claims for electronic surveillance. And then they go through the case law that says there is a one-year statute of limitations to bring that claim. Brittany also has not reopened any prior accountings, nor has the court allowed prior accountings to be reopened. And I'm curious as to why there's been no motions about that. Because they're not wrong. They haven't been reopened. They say, see id the minute order from October 10th, 2022, saying here, contrary to Ms. Spears' assertions, the Hudson case does not stand for the general proposition that past accountings in this proceeding should be reopened and that Ms. Spears has not addressed the applicability of Hudson with evidence of extrinsic fraud. And they go on to say, Brittany has not filed any new objections to the 12th accounting and allowed the statute of limitations to run on filing new objections. I think the old objections are probably all there is with that. I don't know why there's not been filings reopening the prior accountings. They keep alluding to it. But I don't disagree here that they have not filed any motions to reopen it. They go on to say Brittany's counsel voluntarily submits and relies on Vaslov statements and the purported expert testimony of a body. And then they're going through that is why they believe they should get discovery. That discovery might be limited. I think the argument that Black Box should turn over discovery, not Vaslov, because they're the employer, is probably accurate. Um, but we'll see. They say Brittany's counsel claims a body's testimony and Vaslov's statements will be the basis of Brittany's case at trial. Yeet had filed a motion to strike the Abadi Declaration of Objections that repeat and rely on the declaration. The court relied on Brittany's opposition to deny James' motion. Sorry, to deny Jamie's motion. Brittany's counsel claimed that the Abadi Declaration and Valslav statements will be the crux of Brittany's case at trial. And then it cites that, quote, the allegations are based upon documentary evidence. The allegations are based on physical evidence from a whistleblower. The court agreed in its ruling that the declaration should be dealt with at trial. You're going to have to deal with the discovery before that, though. And they are. And that's why we're all here. They go on to say that Brittany Kroll, Abadi, and Vassilov refused to produce documents. Again, this is from James Spears' side. We've seen Brittany's team saying they've produced some things, but they think other things are privileged. And that is why this is all before our discovery referee, so they can all fight over what should be turned over and what shouldn't be. The Court of Appeal intervenes, finds a privilege waiver with respect to the Abadi Declaration, and recommends a discovery uh, referee. Jamie filed a petition for writ of mandate after the court denied Jamie's attempt to obtain discovery from Brittany and Kroll. Each party submitted multiple briefs. On December 16, 2022, the Court of Appeal issued an alternative writ of mandate and found the declaration waived any attorney-client privilege. The Court of Appeal directed the probate court to either, quote, vacate only its order of July 27, 2022, granting in full the motion to quash the deposition and enter a new and different order denying the motion or show cause why a peremptory writ of mandate ordering the probate court to do so should not issue. So the appellate court is telling the probate court to do their order again. The alternative writ did not mention Paloma versus U.S. Industrial Fasteners, Inc., the Court of Appeal recommended additional briefing regarding whether a subset of documents may retain their privilege because Jamie directed the subpoena to a body's employer, Kroll, rather than a body personally. So this is where the discovery dispute is. What should be turned over when? The probate court refers all discovery disputes to a discovery referee. On January 12, 2023, the probate court reserved its order granting the motion to quash the court ruled in response to the alternative writ of mandate, the court vacates its order, granting the motion to quash the uh, deposition subpoena to Kroll and enters a new and different order. 
The court referred to all pending and future discovery disputes to the referee. So at this point, the court that this has been in front of for years was just like, go deal with the discovery referee. I'm not dealing with these discovery motions. I wonder if that's because the appellate court was like, you can't do that the way you did that. I wonder if it was a response to that. The three pending discovery issues the court referred to the discovery referee are one, the court's January 12th, 2023 minute order regarding the Kroll subpoena, two, Jamie's October 11th, 2022 motion to compel Kroll's compliance, and three, Jamie's October 12th, 2022 motion to compel the Vasilov subpoena. And then they get into their legal arguments saying that all of these things should be required to be produced. But what both motions have done is really well laid out what they're fighting over in front of the referee, but that's not open and we're not going to see it until we get these updates to the court. Conclusion for the foregoing reasons, Jamie respectfully requests the referee recommend to the court that it issue an order requiring Vaslovs and Kroll to produce all responsive documents and a privilege log within 14 days, pay sanctions as requested. So they are still going after sanctions. Um, they have attached some of the case law to their motion, which takes their motion to 29 pages with key sites. What I will say for all the attorneys involved in this case is all of the case law cited um, isn't from ChatGPT. So we're there with that. And for anyone looking at the YouTube video, you can see the different layout. If you've been following my coverage of the ChatGPT lawyers, the very different layout when you print it out from a service um, like Westlaw or LexisNexis versus the way it looks. This one is from Westlaw versus the way it looks when it is printed out from, you know, chat GPT. So there's that. This discovery dispute is not over. If Kroll and Abadi are going to be relied on at the trial for the 12th accounting, then there are some things that might need to be turned over in discovery. However, the 12th accounting really is about the fees that were paid. So the discovery should be narrowly tailored to anything that was paid in the 12th accounting and whether or not those amounts paid are proper, because that's really what the 12th accounting objections are about were the things paid proper and to the extent that Kroll knows things were not proper that might need to be turned over in discovery but those also might be things already within the control and dominion of James Spears and and you know TriStar and everyone else it's like well we're saying that the the payment to TriStar is improper because there's no contract y'all have it or you don't you are on the same side go get it from your people so that's all before the discovery referee i don't think any of this is going to be resolved before the july 24th trial setting hearing i'm worried that they're going to set this thing out into like 2025 um to deal with discovery disputes we will maybe see on july 24th if a trial date is set for the 12th accounting what does that mean if a trial date is set for the 12th accounting let's talk about that real quick and then I'm going to get some questions and then we are done with today's podcast. If a trial is set for the 12th accounting, then all of these witnesses and evidence will go before a court to decide what should be paid and what shouldn't be paid. I think we will learn a lot more about what's going on or was going on in this conservatorship if and when this 12th accounting goes to trial before a judge, not a jury trial, a judge trial. Um, if that happens, I intend to be there. It's not going to be streamed on TV or anything like that. I think it will be reported on, or at least I hope it will be, because at the end of this conservatorship, what was being paid out seems a little wild to me, but I worked a lot of fraud cases, and it normally starts small, and then it grows as it gets emboldened. The fraud itself gets emboldened, and it grows. So I'm wondering if what we're seeing objected to in the 12th accounting is kind of the wilding out at the end of the finances that were being paid. And that seems supported by a footnote saying that tens of millions up to upwards of maybe 10 figures were paid out of this estate. And maybe it answers or starts to answer the question of why Britney Spears' estate after decades um, in the music industry is not where most think it should be because of the amount of money that was being bled out of this estate to everyone around her. And she had no say in hiring them, firing them, what they were spending, how they were spending. And it seems that for decades, there was no one in this conservatorship protecting her in that. And that we have finally gotten somebody to come in and object. And now we are years deep in litigation that is continuing to cost 
her more money. And that is deeply, deeply frustrating because I wish that at some point we would get to the point where Brittany would be able to be free of this and live her life. Um, and I don't know when that will be. So I'm going to get to a few questions from our amazing members who are asking questions. Uh, I record a lot of the podcast episodes with our member community so they can ask questions and interact while I'm going through this. And sometimes they're my research assistants that are like, Emily, you said this instead of that. I'm like, oh, yes, I did. And then the editors can fix it before you all hear it, <laughs> which is fantastic. So thank you to all the members. I'm going to get to a few of your questions. Kimmy Lockyer asked, why did the judge change? The judge isn't changing the judge penny is still the judge in charge of the probate case but the case is getting sent out to a long cause trial court for trial that's not what judge penny does in their court so it is getting sent out to a trial court that's not uncommon particularly in los angeles that when something is set for a long trial it will go to another court that just does trial that means that trial court isn't also taking care of an entire docket of cases because especially in probate if you take on a multi-week trial in probate court but only have half the day to hear the trial that multi-week case doubles or triples in time that it takes so often in los angeles they will send them out to cases or to courtrooms that are just open to handle trial cases that aren't covering a regular calendar so that is mostly scheduling and then with the referee it's because the court said a discovery referee needs to do it. Basically, I'm not handling this. Send it to the discovery referee to take a look at. Z asked, what authority does the referee judge have? Can they speed up the decision on the 12th accounting? Can they override the trial judge? The discovery referee is just determining what documents get turned over. They really have no authority to deal with the court and the way the court is handling things. They are simply deciding these documents get turned over, these documents don't get turned over, and that is it. It is a very narrow issue that the discovery referee is dealing with. That's a really good question. Thank you. Catherine Smith said in England and Wales, the court reviews accounts of a protected person every year. Does this not happen in California? It does happen in California. These accountings were approved without objection every single year until the 12th year. And the objections were raised by Brittany's counsel at that time and then picked up by Rosengart and ran with but we saw not a single objection until this 12th accounting. And those objections were brought by her former attorney. Kendra Kraft asked, is there a time limit on when they have to have the 12th accounting done? The 12th accounting's done. They're just objecting. Brittany's team is objecting to what is in the 12th accounting saying, your honor, you can't pay this. So they're fighting over whether it should be paid out or not. The accounting itself is done. There's just a disagreement over it. Stina G said the nightmare that the 12th accounting has become. Do you think that could be a factor in why they haven't reopened any others just to finish one and be done? It's a po it's possible. It's really the client's decision here, right? Brittany is no longer in a conservatorship. She gets to decide with her lawyers what she wants to do and doesn't want to do. If if the lawyers are saying we want to reopen all these accountings and Brittany is saying I want to be fucking done with these people. I want to close this chapter of my life and I want to move on. There's not even any money there to get any more anyway. Why would I continue to fight? Close the door. Then that's what the lawyers are going to have to do. So the client gets to make these decisions. And it's possible that Brittany really just wants to close the door on all of this. You can't really let the 12th accounting go. Those objections are already there. That process has already been started. And that is to prevent money from being paid. It's not trying to claw back money that's already been paid out for the most part. So that's really up to her to decide. And I said, lawyer brain in me gets it. This is expensive. It is emotionally exhausting. It is draining. And it keeps her tied to Jamie Spears. He gets to keep having a say in court documents. Reopening it will extend that process for years. Closing the door means he doesn't get to have a say anymore. And that might be the best thing for her emotionally is to have him have no more say, no more court documents to talk to the media in, and no more, nothing else to keep him tied to her. Legally, would I love to see all of this dug up and open? Yes. 
Emotionally, do I understand the toll that that might take? Yes. So these should be her decisions. And I respect how she decides, right? Because I can't sit here as a commentator and say, keep throwing money at this to fight a fight that even at the end, if you win, there's nothing for you. That's a hard thing after 13 plus years um, of conservatorship, after extensive legal battles of things that happened during the conservatorship, I would understand wanting to sever the ties, close the door and walk away and be done. I would absolutely understand that decision. I just wish we knew, right? Like the emotional part of me. I just wish we knew. Um, but I understand. Kylie asked this question, which is I think what we're going to end with. Is this legal battle the only strings attached left for Britney to the conservatorship? Yes. Unless they reopen something else, this is it. Once these things are ruled on, it shuts the door. We've narrowed it down to fee petitions and the 12th accounting. It's all money stuff that remains now. And once that's done, it severs all ties and there will be no more filings. And this will finally be done unless Brittany chooses to sue Jamie. There's a someone pursues criminal um, actions for the surveillance and other things. Unless something else is initiated, this is it. And this could be and should be the end. So it's the financial stuff that is still not done yet and won't probably be done for quite a while because we still have those two orders to show cause with regard to the end of the the very end of the conservatorship that accounting's not done and approved and then the first accounting for when james spears was removed before the conservatorship was over there are some shorter accountings that are not done yet i don't think those will take as much time as this has but until this 12th accounting is done it feels like nothing else can move on and it feels like Brittany can't move on because I imagine having to pay these legal bills and know that these are hanging over your head continually is something that keeps you tied to this, to this period of time and maybe in a way that she really doesn't want to be. It's looking through these just pisses me off, honestly, every single time. It's so much litigation and I understand why the 12th accounting is being fought so hard, but it it's just unending and it's unyielding. It's a tremendous amount of litigation. I will keep you updated on the live stream with what happens at that July 24th trial setting. That is not the beginning of a trial. It is to pick yet another date and we will see when that date gets picked. So if you don't follow me around social media, follow me because I will be updating you when that court hearing is done. And with that, have a lovely week. I will see you in the next one, Law Nerds. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Let's all raise a glass together. Say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your 4th of July, if you're in the United States, be lovely. May you enjoy or not enjoy fireworks, depending on where you live and how dry the weather is there and whether or not it is a fire hazard or not. May you enjoy drone shows, which is, I think, what they're going for in California, which will prevent fires, which is a good thing. May you enjoy it. May your family be well, and may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. You can find more Law Nerd goodness in our private Law Nerd community over at LawNerdsUnite.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm covering, you can follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I recap those streams for those of you a little pressed for time over on the Quick Bits podcast and Quick Bits YouTube channel. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.